Welcome. Tonight we'll be talking about J-Hipster and Kubernetes, and it's a very unique circumstance because what we're going to allow you to do is make the choices for the application that we develop. I'm going to turn my clicker on here. And then how many people are Java developers? All right, most of the room, that's good. Right audience. How many people consider themselves web developers? Okay, good portion, over half. Yeah. All right. Uh, how about the frameworks that you use for the front end development? Uh, how many people here use Angular? Angular, okay. okay good, 10. Yeah. Right. React? Okay. A little, a little bit less, but yeah. a lot, right? And the last one is Vue. Vue.js. Okay. All right, so just a couple. Perfect. Last night we had a split between Vue and React, didn't we? Yeah, I think, I think so. more Angular, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, interesting. Yeah. Last night was in Boulder. We did the same talk in Boulder last night, and they had you know a good crowd that showed up. So, yeah. oh, we forgot to take our selfie. Oh yeah, we did. Right, so we got yeah. to take a selfie with you. <laughs> right, and this is because we're developer advocates, so we got to choose to you know prove to our boss that we're working. Yeah. Right. We're not just like snowboarding we're not just the whole skiing, time. Right. Yeah. Here we go. Ready? So pretend like you're having fun, even if you're not. One, two, three. All right. All right. So, we're here to talk about J-Hipster. How many people have heard of J-Hipster? Okay, that's good, half the room. All right, so it's available at jhipster.tech, and it started out as an application generator. And so it was actually created in an Ant project originally, and they needed a way to actually run the node processes that like, you know, took the Angular and put it together, because that's what you did with AngularJS back in the day. And now, it's much more full-featured, it also is called a development platform by a lot of our team, and that's because we have support for like Docker Compose, for putting it into Kubernetes, as well as for CI CD pipelines to generate those. So there's like five different CI CD engines that are supported, and it's very popular in open source. We got you know tons of stars on GitHub, and it supports generating monoliths, microservice apps, and gateways for those microservices. So, so would you like to introduce yourself, Ray? Yeah. So my name is Ray. I'm a developer advocate at Google Cloud. Uh, and also, um, I've been a Java developer for a very long time. And uh, recently, I've been doing a lot of work around Kubernetes. And uh, I'm also working on JHipster. I created the, one of the first uh, JHipster generator to generate Kubernetes deployments. And uh, very happy to be here in Colorado, because I love to snowboard. And the snow has been really, really nice. Right. We had the, ski devo uh, the developer ski day on Monday. On Monday, Christina yeah. was there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was that was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, glad to be here. If you wanna um, contact me on Twitter, it's right there, it's Satanism, and you can direct message me uh, if you have any questions. How many people are on Twitter? About half. That was yeah. higher than okay, expected, that's not right? Too bad. Yeah. All right. Good. And you're also a Java champion, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah so We're both Java champions. Pretty fancy, yeah, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Matt Rabel. I'm a developer advocate at Okta. I typically say I'm just an open source developer because all the code, all the blog posts, everything I write is always open source. I've never touched a line of proprietary code at Okta. So I'm, you know, that's nice. I never get in trouble, hopefully. Um, I've been a web framework enthusiast all the way since Struts 1.0 way back in the day. I had a gig down at Douglas County in, what was it, 2001. And they asked me to come up with a web framework for the project. And I had just learned like JSPs and servlets. And so I was like, what's a web framework? And then Struts 1.0 was released like the same month. And so I was like, let's use that. <laughs> and, uh, and I've been following web frameworks for a long time since. Um, I created something similar to JHipster back in the day called AppFuse. And it was based on Ant. So you know, I'm glad that's over. Um, but you know, I work on JHipster. I wrote a book on JHipster a couple years ago, probably five years ago now. Uh, for InfoQ, and as part of that, I found a lot of bugs, as you do when you write books about open source projects, and so that's how I became a committer, just because I was like fixing stuff, and I think Ray became a committer because of all the Kubernetes stuff, so. Yep. I like to do a lot of skiing and rafting. My daughter likes to join us on the raft trips. She actually has on her college resume that, you know, she's a guide, so I was like, it's a little embellishment, but I think it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> And I own a couple classic Volkswagens, a 66 21 window bus with a Porsche engine, and a, uh, a nice synchro van again that broke down on the way to ski day on Monday. But you know, I'm used to it breaking down, so I called AAA, got a rental car, and I was only an hour late. <laughs> but uh, it turns out it was just some loose bolts. So you can find me on Twitter at mrabel. And now we'll go into Jay Hipster. Yeah. 
So uh, GHipster you know, is an application generator. And uh, it allows you to generate uh, microservices and the monolith. But it on not only just generates the app, it actually allows you to select many, many different options. As you use the generators, you're going to discover that it's going to ask you many questions, like what type of database do you want to use? Do you want to use SQL or NoSQL? Uh, do you want to use Maven or Gradle? Uh, do you want to use Angular, React, Vue, and so on and so, so forth. Uh, even when you do the Kubernetes deployment, we also ask questions for many different options. And based on all the options that you choose, it comes out at the application that's specifically designed for you, right? So somebody actually did a study on this. I didn't know this until Matt showed me the site. Right. Uh, somebody actually went ahead and did a study in 2017. Mm -hmm. They went through a bunch of different options that's actually possible, and they discovered that you, you can actually have 26,000 combinations uh, you know, for the application you try to generate. And uh, I think they also uh, created a CI-CD pipeline of right. some sort to test everything. And uh, according to the paper, 35% of those options will fail. <laughs> so, uh, so out of 26,000 options, 35% uh, of them fail, and that was back in 2017, so it's, 20, it's 2020 now. Yeah, so <coughs> we're gonna see, uh, this is gonna be a fun night because um, today is choose your own adventure, right? So we have a 35% failure rate. And so this talk we based off of the choose your own adventure books. We meant to give some away last night, no one wanted them, so we'll give some away tonight as well. Uh, but, you know, these are, uh, if you were born in the 70s like I was, then they're pretty fun. Choose from 42 different endings, for instance. Um, tonight, we probably have 50 different endings that we can end up with. Hopefully or maybe just works. one, right. which is nothing works. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, so that's the idea. And uh, we'll start with, you know, a few fundamentals. How many people are using Spring Boot? Okay, so that's probably 75% of the room. How many people are doing microservices with Spring Boot? Okay, that's about half those that raise their hands. So uh, jhipster, that's kind of what it's been known for is its Spring Boot support. And we leverage Spring Boot and Spring Security as much as we can. All the different authentication options that you would use with jhipster are still going to be Spring Security. And Spring Boot is the main generator that's in there. There is a support for Kotlin, for instance, but that is a separate module. It's not part of the main core generator. I'll put these down over here. And so I do like to, you know, just go through and look at the stats for frameworks because, you know, it's fun to do. And, you know, Ray, Ray's company has this little search engine product that, you know, has this Google trend. So you can see here that over the last five years, Spring Boot, very popular. <coughs> if you take it out and you compare it to the other ones that at least are on our radar, you'll see that. Uh, Quarkus is actually becoming more and more popular, at least people are searching for it. But compared to Spring Boot, you know, they're barely a blip on the radar. And microprofile is kind of a generic term, right? That's not a specific framework, uh, but Quarkus implements it. So if you're going to do microprofile, you might want to look at Quarkus. And uh, the other technology that's been very popular recently is containers. How many people here are using containers already? Yeah, use, using Docker, yeah. So uh, containers are really, really great um, in a way where we can fuse your application with the runtime environment that you want to execute with, right? In the past, you know, years ago, if I ever needed to deploy something to production, I had to write down how to set up the production environment, what operating system to, to put in there, which version of the JVM, and then somebody else has to go ahead and set it up. And by the time that we try to deploy, nothing works, right? So with containers, you are, you know, you are, do, you are actually uh, controlling your own destiny in a way. You are creating the container image in the vision that you want, and so that the same container image can be deployed across multiple, multiple machines, and they will all work uh, pretty much the same way. And I think this is where uh, then it allows us to do something like Kubernetes, which allows you to be able to deploy your microservices or applications across the entire cluster of machines Every one of these machines can be exactly the same. There can be nothing on it except for Kubernetes uh, because your application and whatever you need, the JVM, is in the container image, right? So we can quickly deploy uh, your container images across a whole fleet of machines. And the one I know about Kubernetes is that it works across different cloud, right? So uh, if you are doing multi-cloud, if you're on-prem and you want to move to the cloud, you can deploy to Kubernetes exactly the same way. You don't really have to change uh, the way that you deploy, which is really nice. Uh, how many people here are already using Kubernetes? Well, very few today. Yeah, it's a handful though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. was well, that? That's why you're here. Awesome. Yeah, he's ready good. to start. Yeah, All right. nice. It sounds good. 
And um, so this, I think this is one of the first choices that we're going to give to people, right? Yep. So this is about uh, whether you want to create a monolith or a microservices uh, application. Now, keep in mind, these are just architectural decisions. You need to make a choice uh, because they both have their pros and cons. It, I think one of the things that we have to be careful of is you know, just not to jump into the latest and greatest things. But at the same time, these new things do have some benefits, right? So monolith, for example, uh, even though we've been doing it for a long time, but uh, you know, the, the benefit is that it's just a single app to manage, right? Uh, people can just work on the same code base, and uh, you have a single CI CD pipeline to create. And if you need to change anything, it's really, really easy. And all of these requests or calls, or you know, if you separate your application properly, like all of these uh, internal calls are just in the JVM, so it's really, really fast. Uh, but of course, you know, in my past experiences with Monolith in one of the hotel chains, you know, it takes about two hours to do a build for my application, and it takes a whole Thursday evening, a whole night. I had to stay up whole night to just deploy it into a uh, WebLogic in integration server and stuff like that, and portal, right? It, it was ridiculously a uh, long time. For microservices, though, the benefit is you are able to create small services, and they can build much, much faster. You can have small teams working on each of the service. However, if you only have one or two people, you can't really work on 10 different services. That would just be very compli uh, complex. And you need to multiply everything by the number of services you have. Right? Do you do monorepo versus um, multi-repo? Do you do uh, multiple CI CD pipelines? Now you have to maintain all of them, and uh, things can get a little bit complex. So today, the choice is yours. This is one of the first choice. Uh, how many people here want to see the monolith? Wait, wait, before oh. we let them choose, let's, yeah. let's preface this with, you're going to make things more complex <laughs> if you choose microservices. <laughs> and we're going to have a real world example of making things more complex. So just to let you know, <laughs> we know things will work with monoliths. And microservices, you know, there can be some issues there. We already know what you're going to choose, but let's go ahead and vote. <laughs> 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 All right, <laughs> show of hand for monolith. Okay, uh, like four, four, five, four, yeah. Six. And microservices. All right, yeah, you, that didn't Darn work it. out so Darn well, Matt. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, that's your choice. You did make that choice. Uh, one thing to <laughs> to remember is that if you cannot manage your monolith yourself, uh, forget about microservices, right? Because now you just got more stuff to to manage. Uh, <laughs> so we suspected you might like the difficult stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and notice this diagram. I specifically drew it because this is something that can actually happen. Follow the arrows. The, the arrows is actually in a cyclical loop, right? So that's not a very good thing for your microservices, right? So there are a lot more complexity than just being able to run your app. You now have to deal with, with network latency, the fact that the services may not be up and running, and then you got to deal with retries and blah. Anyways, you made your choice. Right. So uh, we are stuck. But let us tell you that <laughs> one of the biggest advocates for Kubernetes actually published this blog post just a couple weeks ago saying monoliths are the future. And a lot of the reason for his post was basically that a lot of people are using monoliths to solve a problem that, or microservices to solve a problem they don't really have. It's great for like recruiting. It's great for you know, hiring people. Everyone wants to do microservices, but it might actually not be solving the problem you have. So this blew up on Hacker News. That's why I included it here. And a lot of the microservices posts out there, even the initial one from Martin Fowler in 2014, says start with a monolith and then do a microservice later. And so one of the cool things about JHipster is you can do that, especially if you're doing some prototyping just to proof a concept. You know, start it with a monolith. And what JHipster gives you is like definitions of your entities and relationships between those entities. So you can start with a monolith, and then you can take all that domain modeling that you did and transfer it to microservices. And you'll basically take about 10 minutes to do that. So that's what we encourage you to do. But tonight, you like to be risky, so that's fine. Unless if you want to change your mind. You know, like in magic shows, they always say, do you want to change your mind? No? They don't. No, I guess not. Oh, not wow. today. All right. <laughs> All right, so this one surprised us last night. But let's see what we got here. So how many people want to use Maven? We got five. Gradle? All right, wins again. Yeah, that's right. surprising. Cool. So we just have to preface that with we know Maven commands better. So we might do a bit of Googling, but luckily Array's company you know, provides some good quick links for that. So if we have to do that for Gradle, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Next. All right. Language. So uh, JHipster actually do support generating the backend for different languages. Uh, obviously, the, the native one is Java. 
So that's one of the choices. And uh, it can actually support Kotlin and others via something called the Blueprint. So this is not in the core uh, master uh, branch of the JHipster code base, but these are additional modules you can add on. So you can generate additional things. So uh, I think we support the Kotlin. Right. Uh, .NET, surprising. Right. Yeah, and uh, Node.js. So these are for backend uh, uh, services. So um, let's see if you show of hand. Uh, how many people here want to see the Java backend? Okay, yeah. yeah. We're all Java developers. I'm like not surprised. Half. All right. Yeah. Uh, Kotlin? Yeah, just lose out by close. a little bit. Right. Yeah, close. Uh, .NET. We got one. <laughs> Two. All right. Two, yeah. Yeah, and the Node.js. Really? Oh, wow. that almost that ties is, it. Yeah. Did uh, it tie? I think Java is still kind of Yeah, long. we're at the Java user group. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's if right. you chose .NET, that's a dead end. <laughs> so, um, we'll we were, be, yeah, it's we, over. We yeah. were kind of hoping you'd choose that because then we just go home. <laughs> um, I did some research today and discovered that there are, there is work being done for both Micronaut and Quarkus as back end. So if you are interested in that, um, you can check out those two projects on GitHub. Um, and I believe the Micronaut one's a little more full fledged. Uh, the Quarkus one has instructions on how to like clone it and you know NPM link and all that so it might not be as done but people are working on those. So now the authentication type. So jhipster supports three different ones. Session, that's what that picture on the left is supposed to define, right? A session, typical session application. Uh, JWTs or JOTs, that's what they're actually called in the spec. So how a JWT works is it's just you know an encoded JSON token. It's got three different parts, a header, a payload, a body, and then a signature at the bottom. It's not encrypted in any means. It's just base64 encoded, and that gets sent across the wire and kind of acts similar to a session token. And then we also support OAuth2. So you can use Keycloak or Okta or any OAuth provider with OAuth2. So how many people want to use session authentication? Oh, wait, we can't because we're doing yeah. microservices. Right, microservices so don't have Microservices this doesn't support session, right, because you're going to be communicating between them, so you don't want to share the session. So it's just going to be JWT and OAuth. So JWT. Yeah, majority. Okay. Close okay. to the room. OAuth? <coughs> OAuth is hard. Okay, okay. so yeah. we just got a few. Well, you don't get to make that choice. <laughs> because, you know, it's Okta, right? We've got to show what we do. But we'll show you Keycloak. And, uh, and the cool thing about OAuth that I really like and how we've implemented it in jhipster is there's no client-side code at all. So you could add a new web framework, you know, if you wanted to do Svelte or something like that, and you wouldn't have to write anything for OAuth to work. And that's because we did everything on the back end because it's more secure, and we store the access tokens and all that. We let Spring Security manage all that. The one caveat is, is it does use, like, sessions. Right, and uses cookies just like regular sessions. So if you wanted to have a clustered jhipster app or many, many microservices, uh, from the gateway to the various microservices, that's not going to be stateful. But on the gateway itself to your clients, that is going to be stateful. So you can use Spring Session with something like Redis and then have that as your session implementation, and it could scale just fine. I do have it on my agenda to write a blog post that compares all the different three and actually does some Gatling tests and performance tests them because everyone always says, like, session slower, JWT is faster, but do we really have any proof? We just think they are, right? And the OAuth implementation that we'll be using uses JOTS. So you're essentially using JWT authentication too, but you didn't have to write it. And so if you did choose JWT authentication and use that in your apps, you'd be storing the users in your apps, you'd be hashing their passwords, you'd be managing them, you'd be responsible when there's a breach. Don't you want to blame someone like Okta? <laughs> right? So the next one. Yeah, so databases. So uh, jhipster does support multiple different databases when you're generating an app. And um, you know, depending on what you need, uh, you might need to choose different options. For example, if your data is more document-oriented, you probably want to use something like a NoSQL, like MongoDB. There is a lot of choices for SQL relational databases, including uh, MySQL, MariaDB, Postgres, uh, even MSQL, and Oracle DB as well. Uh, but uh, today we're just going to give you three choices here, which is MySQL, Postgres, or Mongo. So, yeah. All right. So, how many want to use MySQL? Only, only three. I thought MySQL is usually the most popular one. Does anyone prefer MariaDB over MySQL? No, Not even. No wow. Uh, Postgres. That is definitely okay. pretty surprising. Yeah. More. Okay. And um, MongoDB. Oh, a lot more. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll use Postgres. And one of the microservice apps, and then we'll use MongoDB in another one. Okay. How's that sound? Wow. All right. You like challenges. Right. We've got to do two now. Right. 
right. and uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to generate uh, a gateway no matter what we use in several microservices in the back end and uh, the gateway will have its own database as well and that's only for doing like auditing of logins and stuff like that all most of the data that you'll store will be in those back end microservices so the next question is spring mvc or webflux so i do have some uh, speaker notes here let me See if I can pull those up because it's fun to look at. So um, Spring Webflex, we just, I just made work with OAuth in the 6.7.0 version of JHipster, which was released last week. And based on some findings we had last night, now we got 6.7.1. Um, so they did a release just an hour before this meeting, and so hopefully we won't hit any snags. Um, but Spring Framework 5.0 came out with a reactor project and actually implements you know, Spring Webflux, which is a reactor web framework built on Netty. Um, I do see them adding Tomcat support soon because Tomcat has async functionality as well. Um, but the interesting thing here is really, if you're developing CRUD apps, like Spring MVC works very well. And when the first implementation of Spring Webflex came out, Epon, the company that does a lot of JHipster consulting, did a study between Webflex and Spring MVC, and they found for CRUD apps, Webflex was slower. So it's typically if you have streaming data or you have a lot of data, then Webflex is the one to use. So the quote I have here from that study is, performance differences were negligible unless you're doing a lot of API calls at a scale of at least 500 requests per second. So if you have that kind of traffic, you know, Webflux might be better for you. So we'll go back to presenting here. And so how many people would like Spring MVC? Okay, that's the majority. More than, more than half, yeah. How many Webflux? Whew. We got okay. lucky today. Right, <laughs> yesterday it was Spring Webflux. And, uh, and we had to tell people that that was a dead end. Just because what we want to show is the ability to generate these entities and the relationships between them. And you'll see on this ticket here, this is a, you know, it's been out there since May 11th, 2018, so almost a couple years. But the entity generation is not there yet. So it's coming, right? If someone spends a couple hours, they can probably implement it. You'll notice there's even a bug bounty on this ticket. There's a lot of check boxes, but if you were to contribute that, maybe you could get 50 or 100 bucks, you know, as part of it. So. Um, we won't be showing that tonight, but if you wanted to follow this or subscribe to that issue on GitHub with that link on the bottom there, then you could see when we have full entity generation support. I was of the notion of maybe we shouldn't allow it, right? If Spring Webflex isn't good at CRUD apps, maybe we don't need entities, right? right? But right. you know people are going to ask for it, so we'll probably implement them and be like, oh, well, you choose your own destiny. <laughs> All right, so monoliths, we had a number of different JDL options, and for microservices, we have two. So JDL is jhipster domain language. That's how we know we're a hip framework. We have our own domain language. And it basically allows you to define your entities, the relationships between those entities, uh, validation rules, and, uh, and other things like that. It also allows you to define whole applications. And so the two for microservices that we have is an online store and then a blog and a store. So the blog and the store is one that I came up with. Online store is one of the other contributors. The store, I figured if I'm going to sell like Volkswagen parts online, you kind of want a blog to tell about the new products that are coming out and stuff like that, right? So how many people would like to do the online store? We got one and the, okay. so five or six, yeah. seven. What about the blog and the store? Oh, well, it's about even. It's about even. Yeah. What, what do you think? What should we do? Well, uh, does the online store give you both options uh, with two services uh, that we can show MongoDB and Postgres? I've never done it, so. You've never done it? <laughs> could be fun. <laughs> Risky. We'll take a look at them both. Let's look at yeah. it and see, All right. see what we got here. Yeah. So um, we'll pull this up and bump the fonts there a little. So these are all the JDLs that are out there. There's also a bunch more on start.jhipster.tech, but what we do is we store those for each particular user so they have their own. So if we were to look at... Let's see the uh, e-commerce store here. <coughs> there's going to be a, a yeah. make it bigger. So there's an invoice application. There's a notification application. And then there's entities, product categories, customers, yeah. all kinds of relationships. So it's, um, it's actually really nice to be able to define your application and the CRUD uh, objects, entities uh, in its own domain language. So you can define the entities and the relationship between them as well. Uh, however, you can also define many of the options when you're generating the application. So this is under the application config. 
So all of those choices that we made, uh, we eventually will need to uh, modify those um, so that we can generate the application with your choices. So I'm going to do this door and blog because we're about tied. We have more experience there. We're trying to succeed. We have a 35% chance of failure, right? <laughs> and so uh, if, if I go to start.jhipster.tech and sign in here, and you could do this yourself as well. Um, the cool thing is we have statistics on here, so we can see like Angular versus React, how many people are choosing in the last month or the last year, right? Angular is usually more popular just because it's the default, right? If we made React the default, it would probably you know win out. There's also like Maven versus Gradle. You know, you can see Maven's the default, so a lot more people pick that. But the people who like Gradle, like you all, really like Gradle, right? And you're kind of like Maven. Um, there's also generated applications itself, right? This is just from the JDL. You can see that there is, you know, 154 generated at one o'clock today. So there's a lot of people using this stuff. So you can use JHipster Online to create an application. So if I, you know, select GitHub as my provider, I've already configured this in my account. You know, went to Mravel and then you know used that for the repository. And you can see you can actually create the applications or the gateways right here, and then it prompts you for everything. Well, you can also do that in the actual command line. So if I was to open a new terminal and do like make their temp and then CD into there and just run jhipster, it'll prompt me for all the different options. So the basic difference is with this one, like as soon as you make the choice, you can't really go back, right? If you're using the online version, you can kind of go back and change your choices as you go. So like I said, we're going to use the JDL. So I have one here from previously designing my entities. So I can open this up. And this is JDL Studio. So we have you know, a web-based interface for you to actually you know, make your stuff work. So this is going to be our gateway here. We're going to use OAuth 2. We'll use Postgres there. What we learned last night is Elasticsearch is a memory hog. So we're not going to do that one. And uh, just make things a little easier. We'll use service discovery type of Eureka. We'll put all our entities on the gateway. So this is something that I've only recently learned about, and that is that we are developing a monolith on the gateway. And because we're developing a monolith for the UI and a microservices architecture, we're kind of developing a monolith, right? Because if you change anything in the microservice and there's UI changes that need to happen as well, you got to redeploy that gateway. So we have started investigating micro front ends, which would allow like the UI to live with the microservice and then we would lazy load it into you know, the gateway itself. So then there would be its own autonomous unit. So watch for that if you're interested. So then we have this blog application. It's a microservice. We're using OAuth 2. And we'll take out Elasticsearch. Oh, we got to change the build tool, right? So we'll add build tool uh, Gradle. Yep. yep. And then we'll copy that one. So how it works is. Anything that is a default, you don't have to specify. So here's all the defaults. You can see the application type is monolith. Authentication type is if you choose a UAA application, which is your own OAuth server, then you know it'll default to UAA and uh, all these other things in here. So one uh, one of the things I don't think we got this recorded, which, which is the front end uh, technology. Oh right. Yeah. So the default one is is Angular. Is Angular. Um, but we can do React or Vue. But the problem is Vue doesn't actually, the JDL doesn't support it now because it's a separate blueprint. But in JHipster 7, it will be part of the main blueprint, so you could do it with JDL. So just to simplify things, we're doing the JDL, so we can only choose between React and Angular. Or Angular. Yeah. What happened to that slide? Huh. Oh. Is it, maybe it's there yeah. and we just never <laughs> made it to it. <laughs> Whoops. All so right. how many people want to see? Yeah, there we go. Yeah. How many people want to see Angular <laughs> front end? Angular, okay, and the React. Ooh, it's another I think there's more React. I think there's more React today. All right, we'll try it. We will have to try it. That's uh, we're going down a path that we never uh, embark on before. Right, so. but that's the beauty of choose your own adventure. Yeah, right? yeah. So because yesterday was more Angular, I think. Right, we ended yeah. up using Angular last night. So yeah, uh, look at the options here, and uh, what's it? Client. Framework, yep, so client framework. We have to specify that up here. Client framework, React. OK. OK, and then we need Gradle down here. 
So the, 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 uh, the front-end framework, framework would only be applying the gateway because that's the front-end that will communicate with the back-ends. Right. Yeah. And then there's a number of different caching options. We're not showing them here, but you can use Hazelcast or InfiniSpan or Memcached for any like JPA entities. And right. you'll see for, uh, for MongoDB, we turn that off. And then we have our entities here that have, you know, whether it's required validation rules, the min and max lengths. Um, and then we have relationships here. So many to one, a user can have many blogs. A post can blog to, you know, one blog. Uh, many to one there, and then many to many post to tags, and the pagination rules, uh, where the microservices are and what entities they have, and then you can even do like Docker Compose and Kubernetes in here. So we're not going to do those because Ray wants to show you all the choices you get instead of just you know picking them for you here. So yeah. we'll grab this, and we will create a new directory called djug make der well, there's a cool one. Did you know about, what is it, take? It creates a directory and CDs into it. What is that? Wait, right? what? Yeah. Is that the Z shell thing? Yeah, Z shell, yeah. Oh, okay. In there, right? So That's then cool. we can create an apps.jdl here. Put that in there. And then um, I have a number of aliases. So if you're using oh my ZSH, uh, there's a whole bunch that start with JH. You can see, like, these are a lot of them are to start actual like Docker containers, um, but just JH is short for JHipster. So we can do import JDL and do apps.jdl. And while that's running, I already generated a monolith, and I like to show the monolith because one of the mistakes we made last night was we never showed a running app for 90 minutes. <laughs> because he never started. <laughs> well, because it was using so much memory and stuff, right? We were starting 16 different containers with Docker Compose, and I only allocated like six gigs, and I need to allocate like 16. You know, it's a 32 gig machine. So what I wanted to do while we're waiting for these applications to generate is actually show you what the UI looks like just from another application we generate. So this one's going to be a monolith. It's going to use React and Gradle as well. But it's also going to um, use a health tracking system that I invented called 21 points. So how 21 points works is you can get three points a day. So you can get 21 points in a week. If you exercise, you get a point. If you eat well, you get a point. And a lot of this was based on a 21-day sugar detox I did. And so I found that if I don't eat sugar, I actually lose weight and get a lot healthier. And so it was that and then booze, right? So you lose a point if you drink in a day. So you know, if you're drinking and you're not exercising and you're eating a bunch of sugar, that's a zero-point day, right? So I try to get like 15 to 18 points in a week. And that's what the app does is actually tracks your points. And it also has ways to track like your blood pressure and your weight so you can see like graphs of how all that's working. So it's, uh, it's up and running here, and we can log into it. Um, I think it's using Keycloak. So Keycloak is already running in a Docker container here. Um, usually you do have to start that. I got lucky, it was still running. And then I'm logged in as an admin user. I can go to like a blog. I can go to post. Hmm. Right, and I can see the administration as well. So if I were to look at Oh, you know what? This is interesting. Yeah. This happened to us last night as well. So jhipster supports progressive web apps. And progressive web apps allow you to have offline applications. It caches like an app shell in your browser. And you'll notice here, look at that up in the corner there, it says gateway. So this is the progressive web app that I last used at localhost 8080. This isn't the app that I actually wanted to use. So I have to go into application here and delete it. And then if I were to go to 8080 here, you'll notice it's a whole different app, right? Healthy Hipster, right? And so if I sign in then, you know, go to Keycloak, come back, I'm logged in, but my entities are different, right? So we made this mistake last night, and it must have been like five minutes before we realized it. We're like, yeah. oh, saving, uh, you know, this entity doesn't work. But the back end was totally different, right? It didn't even have the APIs we're looking for. Because so. the front end was cached in your browser, right. and it was showing the wrong one the whole time. So if you, you know you wanted to say, my blood pressure is pretty good today, you know, 130 over 80, you could assign it to your user, save it, <coughs> and all that's working. And if you wanted to delete it, you know, you can do that too. And the demo that Ray likes is the end-to-end -end test. So yep. you can uh, run yarn or npm e2e, and it'll actually drive the UI and enter entities, and it has tests for everything as well. So not only back-end tests, but front-end tests, and it tests all the various functionality of the app. So it's got like statistics on the performance. It's got
got all the configuration from Spring Boot. It's got a Swagger API and all that. So this is a great way to just confirm that everything's you know working. I, and yeah, I think this is by far one of my favorite, favorite features because in the past uh, it's all manual testing and to script everything out you have to start from the beginning. It takes a lot of time to just script this, right? So jhipster generates the basic script for you right. and it's gonna be a lot easier for you to adopt this practice and create more and more tests as you are building your application. All right, so since Keycloak was running, I'm a little worried. Let's see if other Docker things are running. Uh, just Keycloak, so let's, uh, let's just stop those. So D stop. That's just a shortcut I have for stopping the Docker containers. And now what we want to do, I already showed you Keycloak, right? So probably be more interesting to see Okta. If you go to jhipster OAuth 2, you can find the documentation for that. And it's basically just, you have to configure a couple things. So Keycloak is the default. This is how you would start that Docker container. In the gateway or in a monolith, it's going to be in your source main Docker directory. And then um, this is what's there by default. So it's talking to the issuer from Keycloak. It's got a client ID and a client secret that we've already hard-coded in there. And we built up that Keycloak instance for you. And then if you want to use Okta, you basically can switch it to your Okta domain. But at the same time, what this does is it puts your information into your configuration files. Client secrets should never be in configuration files. So what we recommend is to use like environment variables instead. And uh, you could do that, for instance, down here, right? So you could export those variables and do it that way. Uh, what we're going to do in the microservices example is we'll actually use Spring Cloud Config to store those properties. And then that will propagate to all the different microservices. And so you only have to do it in one place. But just to show you that there is some setup you have to do on Okta, you have to create a role admin and a role user. And that's because jhipster expects those roles to exist. And there's stuff in the UI that hides like an admin menu if you're not an admin. And then you also have to go and create a new claim for the groups and put that in ID token so they're actually in there when the user gets it. And we're working on automating that with a Maven plugin. So in the future, you might not even have to do that. So now what we'll do is in the, uh, what is it? It's the jhipster registry. So I'm just going to source uh, this octa.env file. So I can show you what that looks like. Octa.env. That has those exports in there. I went and created an app on Okta, and it has you know that ID and secret. So if you're quick, you can copy that secret. YouTube, you got it. So I got to make sure and delete this app after we're done here. But I can source that, right? <laughs> octa.env. And then I can go ahead and start the various Docker containers. So I'm going to need, uh, I don't need Keycloak anymore, but I'm going to need gateway, source, main, Docker. And uh, what do we have in here? We need jhipster registry. So that's going to be our Eureka registry that all the microservices are going to talk to. And then they have like a logical name that they can talk to each other with. So we're just going to do up dash D. And then this central server config, we might actually be able to, to configure them all that way. So let me look at that real quick. We'll stop this one and go into djug and let's see, gateway, source, main, docker, central, and then what's in here? It should be an application, docker. Now we won't use that one. We'll just use environment variable. So start up the jhipster registry. And then uh, for the store, we're using Mongo. So we're going to have to start that, docker, compose, Source main docker mongodb uh, yml up dash d. And then we're not using Elasticsearch, so we shouldn't need that. No. So we'll go into the gateway, and we'll just start this one with Gradle W. We do use the Gradle wrapper for everything and the Maven wrapper, so you don't have to have those installed. And then we'll go into the djug, and we'll call it just the blog one. And again, we'll source those environment variables. And then we'll start the blog. And then we'll go into the store, source again, and start the store. Now, for the blog, though, I noticed that you didn't actually have to start a Postgres database for it, right? Right, and that's because we didn't specify. You can specify different development or production databases. We only specify production as Postgres. The default is H2. So that's yeah. in-memory disk-based. And you can make it fully in-memory, but the problem is then you lose all your data every time you restart, right? So the disk-based one stores it in like your target or your build directory, and you'll have your data each time it restarts.
but it's nice for development just to make things right. a little faster and you don't have to start any Docker containers. Yeah, but, but for Mongo, we needed to start the Mongo container right. because there's no like embedded MongoDB that you can just Well, there add. is actually. It's called Flapdoodle. Has anyone oh. heard of it? What? So yeah, Flapdoodle is a dependency that you can add to your pom.xml or build.gradle. And I think jhipster probably has it in there, but it's normally used for testing. It's just a test dependency. And, uh, right. and it'll fire up an embedded database and everything. But if you take out the scope of test, then you got your embedded database. That's right. Well, maybe yeah. we should do that yeah. eh. in the future. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So Contributions will come. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so if we go to uh, localhost 8761, that's where our jhipster registry should be running. Uh, let's see what Docker says here. Doesn't say anything. Registry. Exit in. Well, it seems to be running. Maybe we'll just play it. And since I already showed you the working app, we're not going to spend too much time on it because what we know is that Ray's going to try to get it running in Google Cloud, right? So oh, thanks. we don't want to like <laughs> reproduce everything too much for you each time. So I think that's starting up. That's uh, what you said yesterday when it didn't work on your machine. Right. <laughs> There we go. It works. So here we go. We have the gateway. And uh, if we were to sign in, it redirected to Okta. Since I was already logged into Okta, you didn't see anything, right? So you can see that's my Okta username there. That's really and cool. then if I were to go to like the blog, you know, I could go ahead and add a new one. You just ignore that Hystrix timeout there. No big deal. And I'll just say, you know, Matt's blog. And the handle would be Matt. And then I'll sign it to my user. And so there is something back here. Uh -oh. There's an access control. And some of these might not have registered. So um, let's go back here and look at this one. Right, because so the registry was not up. Right. I guess, so yeah. when you do it with Docker Compose or Kubernetes, there's usually like an order that things have to start in. Right? When you're starting it just individually like I am, they can get out of sync. But you'll see they're all up and running there now. So let's try it again, localhost 8080. And sign in should happen. And if we go back to the blog, and you'll notice there's a bunch of default data in here. We use Faker.js for this, so we find that you know developers often you know have to enter data and then do stuff with it. So we just do that for you. So if I do you know Matt's blog now, uh, Matt, and sign it here, then that should work. Nope. Well, that's what you get for choosing React. Um, let's try the product, right? So it is actually we have from him, right? We'll now. try uh, adding a beer and make it expensive, like we're in Norway, like I was last week. And uh, oops, I chose the bus in the van. And it's 1.6 megs. Let's see if it handles it. That did. That one worked, right? So yeah. there's the pictures of my kids, middle child. The oldest one's back there, but you know, these are the middle children. So um, the other thing we can do is we can uh, go ahead and actually modify and make this into a PWA. This will be the last thing I do before I turn it over to Ray. So if we were to search for service worker, we comment it out by default because as you saw, it's a real pain in the ass when it actually stores and caches everything in your browser. And as web developers, we've been trying to get it to stop doing that for you know the last 10 years. So um, we're just going to make that, and then it'll be there. So now uh, the most important thing is if you're doing git, it actually created and committed all these into Git projects, right? So um, I have to remove like gateway.git because we're going to just put them all in the same repo. And so then blog.git and then store.git. And then we'll go ahead and go to github.mrable and I'll create a new repo. And we'll call it DJUG Microservices. Just make it public. And then I'll grab that. And then we can go ahead and get init. And then get add. And then get commit. Initial check in. And then add the remote and push it. So there's also a sub generator like I showed with Docker Compose. So that's what I did last night. And if I generate the Docker Compose, 
then what I can do is build Docker containers and then start everything with one command. And it does take a little while. That's why we didn't want to do it tonight. It's like five or six minutes of me asking you if you have questions and you waiting for it to start up and then hopefully everything starts up. And since Ray is going to build Docker containers anyway, we just felt it was kind of redundant. So let's, uh, let's go back here. Uh, find the browser that our presentation was in. There it is. All right, so one of the things I do like to show is just stats because I think they're fun and some people get mad at them. Um, the different frameworks, uh, Vue isn't that popular. If you follow the right people on Twitter, it certainly is. Um, but people hiring for jobs, React is one of the most popular. Also, you'll notice here, most people have problems with Angular and React on Stack Overflow. Not as many with Vue. But really, it's just, it's an indicator of community size, I think. If you have a very popular framework, you know there's going to be people that are inexperienced with it and asking a lot of questions. Also, Vue doesn't barely show up on the blip of the radar for Google Trends, um, but Angular and React are certainly popular. And it's interesting that they actually have the same dips, right, and peaks. So they're related that way, but React is, is used by a lot more people nowadays. One choice we did not give you was PWA or mobile. So PWA, like I said, you know, is a mobile app or a web app that looks like a mobile app. But JHipster also supports both uh, Android and iOS. And we do that with different projects. So if you chose mobile, we were going to make that the end. Um, but yes to PWA, I showed you this file. You go in there and comment that out. And then one of the things that PWAs do require is HTTPS. So in this instance, if we ran a test with Lighthouse on the app when it's running, it would get a lower score than it could because it's not running under HTTPS. So in production, you might want to set something like this that detects an HTTP connection coming in and then redirects it to HTTPS. So this is an example that will work on like Heroku and Cloud Foundry because there is some header that gets set by the front end on their side and it looks for the X forwarded proto and then does a redirect. And so there's a lot of other tips on how to secure Spring Boot in this blog post there that I wrote with Simon Maple. We call it 10 excellent ways to secure your Spring Boot application. So if you want to know about CSP or HTTPS or how to configure any of that, we have that all in there. And so for Ionic, we support Ionic. And I wrote this generator with help from a few friends in the community. And it will allow you to generate an Ionic app. And if you have that JDL with those entity definitions, it will generate that on your Ionic app as well. And it will talk to JHipster. So it will ask where your JHipster app is. If you're using JWT authentication, it'll use JWT. If you're using OAuth, it'll use OAuth. Same for React Native. There's an Ignite J Hipster module out there that allows you to create an Ignite J Hipster app. And this one's even better than Ionic in the sense that it'll read the whole application definition from that JDL and generate the whole app without even knowing where your back end is. So that works really nicely as well. And so I did show you the jhipster.tech, right, if you wanted to go and make your choices that way, or you could do it from a console. And that healthy hipster one I showed you, you know, has all those unit tests or those E2E tests passing. But also, if we run it through Sonar, you'll see here we have 67% coverage on both the Java and JavaScript. So those ship out of the box with jhipster. It's got, you know, very good code quality. And when I ran Lighthouse on the actual gateway or on the, this healthy hipster app, you'll notice it got 100 on the performance. And I did have that service worker comment it out, so it did register as a PWA, and everything else looks pretty good as well. So that project's on GitHub if you wanted to check out that monolith. But now I'm going to turn it over to Ray to talk about the different deployment options that JHipster has. OK. It's, uh, I got everything set up here, so we can continue. And uh, by the way, if you ever have any questions, uh, just you know, ask at any time. And um, so what happened was that uh, Matt went ahead and uh, checking his code. I just went ahead and pulled it down. So I just get a git clone. So I have everything that he created so far. Um, to uh, deploy this into Kubernetes, uh, let me just go back to the slide a little bit. Uh, we do have a generator for it. And we will generate all the YAMLs for you. Because uh, why would you want to write all of those YAML files? Uh, there will be a lot of YAML files that you are going to create. Um, if you ever try to use Kubernetes, uh, you have chosen the path to become a YAML developer, basically. Um, you're going to be writing a lot of YAMLs, but don't worry. JHipster will actually generate a bunch of them for you, so you don't actually have to do it yourself. Uh, this is actually a tweet from James Ward, where if we take YAML to the extreme, uh, he was dreaming of the day where we're using SQL, uh, using YAML to write SQL statements. Uh, that's, that was a little controversial, I think. 
Uh, some people like it, some people didn't, right? But you can imagine like what that might look like. Um, and so in Kubernetes world, we try to store as much decorative states. So these are data, not instructions, but data configurations uh, in YAML files. You don't want to overdo it, um, but uh, we just declare you know, how many instances of your services that you want to deploy, and that's your de declarative desired state. And Kubernetes will try to reconcile, make, making sure that becomes a reality. Um, and Kubernetes is a project created by Google, right, since uh, 2014. It is now owned by the Cloud Native Foundation and managed by them now, so we donated everything there. And, um, you know, it's based on the learnings from the Google's internal orchestration tool, which is called Borg. So everything on Google, everything in Google, uh, runs in Borg, basically. And we use that system to orchestrate and deploy all of our services, including, you know, Gmail, YouTube, and everything else. And uh, we took that system, uh, the learning of that system, and we recreated something called Kubernetes that uses some of the best practices and lessons learned uh, in managing containers at scale. And uh, that's, that's what we have. Um, like I said earlier, um, we have many different ways to deploy the JHipster application that just got created by Matt. Uh, you can, of course, deploy to many different cloud, including Google Cloud Platform, in which case we can deploy this into App Engine, which is the platform as a service. I would call it the original serverless because it's been around for decades, and it can actually scale down your application to zero, and we can scale it out to as many instances as you actually need. Right? So that's, the, that's been around for a very long time. Right? But, uh, but today, we're only going to be doing this uh, for Kubernetes because, uh, first of all, you can deploy this into multiple cloud environments. You can do this on-prem, or even you can do this on your local machine as well. So today, I actually have my uh, Kubernetes cluster created in Google Cloud Platform. It really is just a click of a button, and uh, you can say, I need a Kubernetes cluster with this many CPUs and memory, and we'll just go ahead and create it for you. There's nothing you have to do manually. Uh, everything is managed automatically, So, because uh, I don't want to manage my own machines uh, in the first place. Now, another choice, though, before we go into this generator, is that Kubernetes will allow you to manage your deployments. But since you have chosen microservices, you have additional things you have to consider. So, for example, the, the retry rules, uh, how many times do you want to retry if the backend is not actually up and running, or if you ha actually have a network blip, right, you have to do retries as well. If you have microservices architecture, it's not just that you're running your app that counts. Uh, by the time that you go into production, you actually need a lot more information than a monolith might need, right, because you need to know how each of the services is doing. If any one of them is kind of slower than the other, you might actually have a cascading effect, and uh, it will cascade downstream. Uh, onto other services as well. So for that reason, you really need a way to monitor your applications uh, really well for every one of your services. And also, if you are having, you know, the, my previous picture where a service is calling another one and calling another one and so on and so forth, uh, you need a really good picture of who's actually making the call to what. And we call that in general observability. And, um, and to do that, there's a technique called distributed tracing, right? So you need to build a distributed tracing capability into your app. So the list kind of goes on and on, right? When you're doing microservices architecture, just running the app is not enough. You actually need a lot more uh, infrastructure to operate it properly. So you have two options, right? One of them is to just deploy it, and you try to manage everything from within your app. So this is the typical uh, traditional approach where you have something like Spring Cloud OSS, and uh, Netflix OSS, so you are doing the retries and the resiliency directly inside your, of your app. You try to build in the tracer in your app as well. Or you can deploy this into a service mesh environment, like Istio. So if you think about Kubernetes as a way to declare the state of your deployment, Istio is the one that actually cares about your service-to-service -service communication. So you can use the declarative technique to say, I want to have retries between service A and service B. All you need to do is write a YAML to declare it, and Istio will implement it for you within the service mesh. Okay? So that is a really, really neat technique. So actually, was it, I think it was Matt who came up with the, the terminology. Istio is like AOP for microservices, right? Yeah, so if you think about Java and AOP aspect-oriented programming, right, we're intercepting all of your Java uh, calls. Istio is actually intercepting all of your Java, uh, all of your HTTP requests so that we can apply retries and traces, and we can learn how long each of the requests took by intercepting the request, and we can restore everything. And then you can see it in dashboards like Jaeger, Kiali, uh, Grafana, and stuff like that, okay? So 
how many people want to see just a plain Kubernetes deployment? Oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't mention Istio. How many people want to see Istio uh, as well? OK, uh, slightly more. OK, so let me show you how this generator works. Um, so first of all, uh, I'm going to look at the left-hand side right here. So first of all, we have the application that I just, got, uh, I just checked out. I'm going to create a directory called uh, Kubernetes, or just KS. And if I go into it, it's empty. And we can use the generator, just um, jhipster Kubernetes. Let's wrap around a little bit. And we're going to be able to just generate all of the YAML files that we need. And it's going to ask you a bunch of questions. Uh, first of all, is that you know, the type of application is microservices. And they are all located above my directory, right? I mean, the KS directory, but everything else is above me. So I'm going to go up, dot, dot. And then I can pick and choose which services I want to generate uh, the Kubernetes deployment for. OK, I can do that. And then here's the option that you can say whether you want to use a jhipster registry console with a elk stack. So you can actually deploy the full Elastic Search, uh, Logstash, and Kibana stack, plus Zipkin to do distributed tracing for you as well. Um, I'm going to say yes to this one, because I think that actually works. I think, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and this option right here is uh, whether you want to have a clustered uh, database for Mongo. Um, I'm not going to give you a choice here, because I actually have not tried it. So I'm going to say no, right? And then uh, you get to choose the admin password for the JHipster registry. Uh, in Kubernetes, the cluster is just a bunch of resources, right? You may have 10 nodes with uh, two CPUs each, and then now you just have two, uh, two times 10, a uh, 20 uh, CPU, 20 core cluster. Uh, I have a cluster that is uh, four times five, so I have a 20 core cluster right now, right? We can go up to you know, 5,000 nodes in the cloud, uh, like hundreds of cores in each of the machines, so you can imagine how much resources you can access. So what some people do is that they create a big cluster and then you can carve it up into different namespaces. So rather than creating a new cluster for every one of your new projects, you can just use the existing cluster, but put them in different namespaces so they don't inf interfere with each other, right? So here in the generator, we can pick and choose what namespace I want to put my application in. I'm going to do default for now. And all of these container images, you have to push them into a Docker registry somewhere or a Docker repository. You can use Docker Hub. You can use uh, anything you want. On Google Cloud, we have something called the GCR, which is Google Container Registry. And if you want to use that registry, you just enable it on Google Cloud, and uh, you just use the name, which was prefixed by GCR.io. What that means is that this is a global registry. The image is actually replicated automatically across multiple regions. Uh, or uh, I guess in Europe specifically, maybe they have some more rules. Then you might, you might want to limit the container image to a specific region. So you can put in the EU region or the US region. You can be very specific about that. So I'm going to just use the global one. I'm going to uh, put it underneath my project, which is a Wise Coyote uh, 827. It just auto is randomly generated. I didn't pick it. Right? So now I give it the prefix. So now every image I create will be pushed into my GCR registry. Um, and the Docker push command is just Docker push. And here is whether I want to Istio. I'm going to say yes. And then what's going to happen here is going to be pretty interesting. It actually connected to my cluster. So I have an Istio cluster running already. It actually connected to my cluster. It understands where Istio is going to uh, be able to receive my incoming request. So it actually determines the IP address for me uh, from this remote cluster. And all I need to do is to, uh, to say yes. And uh, now I can use this as my domain uh, suffix, right? because it automatically determines the IP address for me. Uh, based on what I have already running. Of course, you can customize it. If you are running it for your, uh, for your company, you can use your company's TLD as well. Um, and finally, um, we have some databases, right? We have MongoDB, and we have uh, Postgres. And for these databases, we actually have to store the data somewhere on the disk, right? We don't want this to be the in-memory database uh, for your production system. Right. So in Kubernetes, we can provision uh, persistent disks for you as well. Now, there are two ways of doing it. One is a more static provisioning, where you actually have to go and create a disk in the cloud, and then you have to tell Kubernetes how to use that disk. Right? And in different cloud providers, you create the disk differently. In Kubernetes, we have something called dynamic storage provisioning. What that means is that you just tell Kubernetes you need two gigabytes of storage. And Kubernetes will, behind the scenes, interact with the cloud provider and figure out how to actually create the disk. Right? So now you can have this YAML file that's very decorative. 
with the intent of two gigabytes of disk, and Kubernetes will actuate it and actually create the disk for you. Right? In this way, you can then carry the same YAML file across different environments. You don't actually have to change it. So I'm going to say yes to that. And every storage that you create, you have the option to select the different class. Especially in the cloud, we have some faster storage that's based on uh, SSD, right? Or we have slower storage that's just a persistent disk in, on a spinner, right? So you can pick and choose what type of disk you want to use by specifying the class. If you don't specify anything, it's just going to do the default one, okay? And just like that, we created all the YAML files for you. That's all declaring the desired state, okay? And we also print out uh, all of the, um, uh, all of the um, command lines you need to create your image and also tagging it and pushing it to the registry. Now, what is really cool is that JHipster project actually adopted a tool created by Google, which is called JIB, okay? If you actually look into the source code here, we have no Docker file. Right? Typically, when you want to create a container, you create, a, you create it with a Docker file. But Docker file is really um, uh, susceptible to errors. Right? Uh, it's really, really hard to write a proper Docker file to run your Java application that is actually secure and efficient. I have a whole hour talk just on that. But if you're using JIB, you don't need any Docker file. You can just use JIB to generate the best container image you can get from a Java application automatically. And you can even build the container image, ship it straight to the registry without having Docker running locally on your machine. Okay, so this is one of the easiest way to create and push a container registry. And it adopts all of the best practices so that we actually analyze your build file and we understand what are the dependencies are, those resource files, and also the classes. And we automatically layer them in our container images so that when you make a change, uh, we only modify the layer that actually changed. So it will speed up your pro uh, development process as well. Okay. So what I'm going to do is just go ahead and copy this, and I'm going to um, go to my each and one of the each and one of the applications. And all I'm going to do is just do run this command with Gradle, and we're going to build a jar, and then we're going to use jib to create a container image and push it straight to the registry. Okay. So I'm going to do that. So that's number one. And let me do the gateway as well. So I'm going to go to gateway and do the same thing. And I'm going to go to do this with the store as well. So where's the store? OK, there we go. So now we're just building our app and uh, building the container image. Now you might notice this actually took, um, this actually went really, really fast. Um, the reason being that when Matt checking his code, when I was sitting down there, I already built the container image once. And because I didn't really change anything, so this, the jib thing is actually going to figure out, well, you didn't actually change anything, so I'm just not going to do anything, or I'm going to push out the tiny layers that actually has changed. And so creating this container image, pushing straight to the, the, the registry was really, really fast. Okay? So now I have all of my container images in the cloud. Then here's the moment of truth. Well, we have to deploy it, right? So we give you this command line. We generate this one for you as well. Uh, it's just a SH file. And all it does is to do kubectl apply all of the YAML files for every one of these uh, directory. And because we opted to use Istio, we also enable Istio here uh, for you by injecting a, a, a label. That's what instructs Istio to actually, uh, to actually be effective, OK? Um, we do need to change a few things here. Um, let me show you some of the things that's been generated first. Let me see the time. Okay, so let me go to blog. So we generated the deployment. So in Kubernetes, this is the way that you can uh, deploy your service. I'm gonna open this up, right? So we generate everything here for you, including the metadata, uh, the selector, the labels. So you can, you know, these key value pairs. We try to follow the best practices. You have the name of your app and the version. Uh, and by default, we just have one instance of each. If I scroll down a little bit more, we have the readiness probe and the liveness probe. So we implement all of these things for you. Uh, and also, we limit the amount of memory and CPU you can use. Uh, you can always change these out later as well. Um, and a bunch of configuration that is specific to Kubernetes and specific to Istio. Okay? Um, and we override the data source. Uh, so this is the connection, JDBC connection to our database behind the scenes. Uh, we also deploy uh, the database, but we also deploy the registry as well, because we chose to deploy that. And here's the JHipster registry. Uh, what Matt was doing earlier was running this in Docker Compose, 
right? So we have the comparable YAML declaration to deploy this into Kubernetes. And as you can see, there is significant amount of configuration. Now, what the registry also has is the config server. Okay, this is cool. So all of the microservices I'm going to deploy will be able to get the configuration from the registry because it's also the config server. And that configuration that you're going to be able to share across the different microservices, they are actually stored here in application config map. Okay. So this is a, the interesting one because uh, in Kubernetes, config map is just a way for you to capture more configuration. And in this case, the configuration is actually another YAML. So we're doing a YAML in YAML kind of thing. Okay. So the config map YAML has the application.yaml that will be distributed in the config server. So one of the things I do need to make a change here is that remember what Matt had to do to configure OAuth 2 with Okta? I have to do the same thing here again. Okay. So what I'm going to do is to copy and paste the Okta configuration into this config map so that it can then be used by all of the other Spring Boot uh, microservices through the config server. Now, I do actually have the Okta stuff here, um, just like his, except I have a lot more. So here I have the invar, but this is the, this is the thing I need. So this is the Spring Boot configuration I need to share. And here's the tricky part, uh, as we all know, with YAMLs. What is the most important thing in YAML? In indentations, right. So I'm kind of stuck here because if I paste it in, uh, everything is kind of offset it in the wrong way. So uh, it took me a while to figure out how to fix it yesterday. So <laughs> I'm hoping it takes a while again. Did you figure it out? That, no, I have not. <laughs> All I know is that I can do a shift here with Vim. And then I got two tabs here. So what I'm going to do is uh, to do some Vim magic here. I'm going to switch out the tab with two spaces global. Oh, I actually got it the first time. Oh, it worked. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> I never imagined getting applauded for this, but <laughs> oh, wait, I practiced yesterday. No, nah, actually, it's not right. Look no? at the client provider. Provider is supposed to be under client. Wait, wait, where, where? Right there. Ah, shoot. Okay. Close. So close. Yeah. So I'm going to do that again. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I wish I'm running ProScript here. I can do that a lot easier in Pro, right? So I'm going to do two spaces. Oh, no, like that. Two spaces, G. Did I screw it up? Yep. Oh, my good. OK, yeah, you, you're all, <laughs> all that excitement. I'm going to go back to the old ways, old-fashioned way. <laughs> Just <coughs> no provider needs to be under client. Oh, like that? Oh, yeah. this is so hard. Like that? Wait, yeah, yeah. like that? All right, that's why my, I knew you here. It's <laughs> and then registration lines up with provider. OK, like that. Oh, man. All right. And this is like that. All right. Fine. It's my favorite part of the whole presentation. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> and I need to make sure that there are no tabs, right? No tabs. What's that? Did I miss anything? Because if it doesn't work, the whole thing fails. So, you know, did I miss anything here? Am I good? Okay. Question mark. Question. Okay. Oh, this one. So this is the way to uh, make sure that the, the question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. The question is this vertical bar right here. Uh, so typically, YAMLs are key value pairs. And if your value is multi-line, like this case, this is actually a multi-line value that goes into this key, then you use the bar to indicate a multi-line um, multi YAML here, or multi-line configuration, or multi-line value. And uh, somewhere along the way in the end, uh, we actually um, have a way to tell, yeah, based on indentation, uh, it cuts off and understands where the value ends. Yeah. So as soon as we got to this YAML file, right, you can see that this indentation is proper, uh, aligned with this one. So we know that everything between here goes into the value for that key. Yeah. Yeah. So this is where if you screw up the indentation, nothing works. Yeah. Huh. All right. Good. Right. No tabs. Right. No tabs. No, nothing deceiving me. Okay. Good. Whew. I, okay. So I think I'm ready. How many people think that this will just work right off the bat? Wow, nobody. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I don't think it's going to work right off the bat myself, so uh, there's no surprise here. You chose all the choices. You, you made all the choices, right? So uh, if it doesn't work, it's your fault. All right. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead. And so here's my Kubernetes uh, environment. I'm going to say git pod, and we can see that we have nothing here. I'm just going to go ahead and run this application, uh, this, uh, this SH file. It's going to apply everything for me, right? So this all these YAML files that we ever created, we got secrets, we got username and passwords, we got 
PVC, which is the persistent volumes. We got Postgres, MongoDB, oh my goodness. We got Elasticsearch, Logstash, Zipkin, Kibana, Grafana, everything is here. We just deport everything into our cluster, including uh, enabling Istio. Okay, and one of the things I'm gonna show is uh, this little command line called K9S. Uh, this is a nice text-based console for Kubernetes. And here you can see the different colors. Uh, red means that it's still not started yet. Uh, blue means that it's running. And we can actually go in it, into it. We can see the different containers that's running inside the pod. And if I wanna see what's going on there, I can you know, go into it. It says the application will start in zero seconds. Well, that's way past time. That's too bad. We can go into here, we can see the logs. Now, apparently, I just learned this from Matt. K9S was created by someone in Colorado. Is that right? Well, not only that, but he's in the room. All right. Fernand, take a bow. <laughs> yeah. Guliana, yeah. It is one of the coolest tools that I've ever seen. Whenever I show it, people are like, what was that thing that you just showed, right? And that's the coolest uh, command line tools I have been using for Kubernetes. So thank you for creating it. This is awesome. Yeah. So, whew. Let me go back. Okay, so we can see that some of the application has already started. Uh, some of them are still waiting to start. Now, one of the things about the, you know, the actual application here, it actually uses something called the, the init container, the initialization container. Um, if I go back to the YAML file for one of these things, now I, can, I don't know whether this is the best practice or not. I actually don't use it myself, but, um, but it is really nice to understand what's happening and it helps you to troubleshoot. Uh, basically, what this, what out of the box Kubernetes thing has is the init container that actually checks whether the database is already up and running. So it kind of waits and kind of uh, orchestrate the startup of your application. The bad thing about it is that you're doing a microservice, so you should be able to handle the failure of your databases, right? So this kind of, uh, you know, potentially makes the application less resilient, even though it's easier to understand and use. Okay, so just keep that in mind. But that's one of the cool things about Webflux as well. Yep. You can start a Spring Boot app with Webflux, and if the database isn't running, it's fine. And then once your database runs, it'll connect to it. And unlike like Spring MVC, if your Postgres isn't running, then it fails on startup. So yeah, yeah. So and if it fails on startup in Kubernetes, we'll go into a crash loop, and uh, we'll try to restart your app uh, another second, and we'll do exponential backoff uh, just so we don't um, you know thrash the the cluster. So luckily today, Matt, everything's running. Yeah, unlike yesterday, we have all these uh, red lines. So today, everything's running, so that's good. And um, what we are going to be able to do is to actually connect to it. So in our uh, bash script here, we can first connect to the console. So this is the jhipster console. So I'm gonna come back here. And uh, we should be able to see, uh, what's in the console, by the way? Oh, a lot of metrics. So this is the Elk stack, so we got Kibana. And uh, we can see the dashboard. And we can see the JVN dashboard. Let me just go there. And uh, if everything connected up properly, well, no results today. But uh, I think when, as the metrics come in, we should be able to see all the JVN metrics. Uh, we do have log stash. So here we can see all the logs that's being propagated by log stash. And ooh, that's no good, man. What is that? Uh, MongoDB, OK, connection, that's fine. Yeah, I think that's OK for now and uh, management and, oh, what is that visualization tool, right? So as you can see, we deployed a bunch of things for you uh, right off the bat. So this is just a jhipster console. Uh, we can also connect to the registry if we want to, like what Matt showed you earlier. But let's go ahead and uh, figure out how to connect to our app. So the way that this is configured with Istio is that every app will have a prefix. So we have the domain name already, right? The 35 whatever NIP. The prefix of the app is uh, the name of the app, which is Gateway. And then the namespace, which is default, uh, and then the suffix, which is the domain name. So if everything goes well, I should be able to connect to it. So this app is actually just being created, which is deployed this into Istio. The moment of truth is whether we can log in, right, based on the YAML file that I tried to indent. Uh, so we can go here and sign in. And you actually want to opt out, so that's a good sign. And then uh, we can do password. Uh, the, well, I forgot the password. I think, it's, I think I know what it is. Yeah, I almost said it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> it is password one, isn't it? I'm gonna sign in, and it's gonna do the OAuth two authentication. Remember, the configuration was retrieved from the config server, right? From that YAML file, and we're logged in. This, yeah, thank you. Not bad. Woo. <laughs> this worked better than yesterday, huh? Right, right. Yeah. 
Oh, well done, yeah. And uh, if we're lucky, we can go to blogs. Wait, uh, blogs is the blog is the the MongoDB one, isn't it? Uh, this is a Postgres one. That's the Postgres one. So I'm gonna say hello, djog. It worked, and the user is uh, demo octa and save. And oh, I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. There was something wrong with this um, because your the other thing for you actually worked. So, oh well, we're pretty close. We're pretty close. I blame React. Try the uh, product. Try the really? Because that one worked. Yeah. And I think like a tag would work too. It's just that first blog one. Uh, what what's a good product name? Uh, Octa. Oh, how much is it? It's like free. Free. <laughs> no, you, you gotta use the number. I think. <laughs> Oh, you're right. This, actually, this one actually works. So then okay. try like a post, because I think it's just something with the blog. Uh, what do you mean? Oh, post, yeah. So let's do a post. Title, um, Kubernetes, and GeoHipster. It worked. Yeah, okay. And then, uh, oh, you need to select a blog. I don't think so. No? Okay. Tag, uh, oh, no tag. All right, save. All right, yeah, so that worked too. That's right. pretty cool. Yeah, so which is the blog that has issues. We don't really know why, so. Right, we find later. a bug every time we do it, so we'll yeah. fix that for tomorrow's day. Well, we found multiple bugs so every time we do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So the last thing I want to show, um, maybe, is um, I want to show you the dashboard that Istio provides you. So for example, if I go into, if we have uh, time, I'm going to go into the namespace called Istio System. Istio System, uh, yeah, and Git service. And here we have a bunch of things. So we have um, the Kiali dashboard, we got Zipkin, we got Trace. Uh, we have uh, Grafana. Why don't I just go to Grafana just to see what's in there? So I'm going to do a pull forward so we can actually go into, uh, we can establish a local tunnel from my machine into the Kubernetes environment. And um, I'm going to connect it to Istio system. And Grafana is running on port 80, 80 no, 3000, right? So I'm going to say 3000 to 3000. And what this will do is establish a secure tunnel from my local laptop into my Grafana dashboard. And because we're using Istio, we should be able to see all the metrics that's associated with my front-end application and also the services behind it. So from this dashboard, I can go ahead and go in. I'm going to go see the MASH dashboard. Uh, and we can see the operations per second. We can see the global success rate. Uh, we can even see it for each one of the microservices that we deployed and also the gateway as well, right? So um, you know, we can navigate into it. We can see the requests that came in earlier just through my web request and the success rate was 100%. I have a feeling that the blog one is probably going to be uh, lower because we had an error, right? So yeah, so that's pretty cool. So that is what you get with Istio. Uh, there's a lot more to show, but uh, if you want to see it, I'm happy to show it to you uh, later uh, after the talk as well, OK? Um, yeah, so we, we deployed the software generator with show K9S, so that's awesome. And right. I think that's pretty much so it. Do you say K9S or K9s? Canines. Canines. Oh, right. So I like see. A pack of dogs, right? Canines. Got it. Right. Yeah, right. like the logo. That's awesome. There yeah. We go. Yeah. Very cool. Who let the pods out? <laughs> <laughs> Who let the pods out? We need to. Woof, we, woof. Need, we need to uh, put it here. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, there we go. <laughs> Done. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this is something that we discovered uh, yesterday. And I'm fine with it, but you know other people might not be. And that is when you do the Kubernetes generator, it doesn't generate anything for Keycloak. So you should always use Okta. No, we. we, we <laughs> Did you do this on purpose? No, I didn't. I didn't touch the Kubernetes generator. That's my fault. Yeah, it's right. my fault. I, didn't, so I never generated it. We yeah. recognize we do need to create that. There is an open ticket out there. We found it's like six months old. Two years old. Two years old. Yeah. So people are interested, but no one's that interested. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so then the other thing is obviously setting those variables like you saw if you wanted to switch to Okta or even if you wanted to use Keycloak. So we'll have to do something in there even for Keycloak to say, hey, here's where the Keycloak you know, image is. Yep. Um, and one thing that, that we do actually especially for Kubernetes and Istio deployment is that remember, uh, we actually have a gateway. The gateway has the front end, but it also has the Zool routers. Okay? So what that means is that when the request comes in, it will hit your gateway first and then through a JVM, through the gateway process, it's going to route the request to the back end. Um, what we have done for the Kubernetes generator in the Istio generator is to give you an option to bypass all of that. Why? Because in Kubernetes, we actually have something called the ingress. And the ingress is a, a mapper that can map these sub-URLs to the back end services. And we can do this mapping for you directly 
without having you to go through the Zool gateway, okay? But the default ingress will not do the retry for you. So if your backend has issues, your frontend will see those issues immediately. Uh, but with Istio, uh, we actually do use the gateway for Istio out of the box. And um, I'll show you the example here in blog. If I go into the blog virtual service, so this is the Istio way of defining a virtual service, uh, we can actually, um, we can not only do the mapping for you, but we can also uh, set up the retry rules for you. So remember what we talked about earlier, Istio is the decorative state for your service-to-service -service communication. So if you want to increase the number of times you want to retry, you just modify the YAML file and you apply it. You don't have to modify your application. Okay? Cool. And so, like I mentioned earlier, we do generate all of the UI code on the gateway. There is an open ticket out there for converting to micro front ends, or at least making that an option. And there's actually a plugin out there or what we call a blueprint that does it. So this company, uh, I believe they have offices in Italy and San Diego. They've created this, and they have a 30-minute tutorial that you can go through and do it. And so that's why I haven't done it, is because I like 10-minute tutorials. 30 minutes is a little <laughs> long, right? So um, I do plan to do that shortly. I'm doing a talk on micro front ends tomorrow at the Utah Jug, so I've got to do it before that to say, hey, J-Hipster supports it, or this works, or it doesn't. So I'll be doing that. <laughs> and, uh, and then I don't think it will be too hard, because Right now what we do is we route right, any service requests to the different microservices. And so we use Zool for that. We're converting to Spring Cloud Gateway at the moment. And just because you know, it's making that HTTP request, it could also make that HTTP request to get the JavaScript from another server. right? And then lazy load that into the front end. So that will be possible with React, Vue, or Angular. So uh, look for that in the next few months. Cool. Well, congratulations to you and us. Right. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, you survived the encounter with YAML today and the paradox of choice. And the paradox of choice, right? You have too many options, like it gets worse. And so J-Hipster does give you too many options, but you took the adventure and you made it, and we invite you to take your own. You yeah. try Monolith first, but, you know, try microservices too. And uh, J-Hipster 7 is currently being worked on, so that's the next one. I have a link to the issue there, and uh, you can see that there's not many things checked right now, right? So <laughs> Nothing's um, checked. But there's also modulus support. And modulus are a way of doing monoliths with the microservice like architecture. And uh, it's from one of the guys at Spring Data kind of came up with it, Oliver. And uh, it's basically using annotations to make sure you aren't tightly coupling your monolith. And then so you could break it apart really easily. And so that's kind of a cool concept. So um, my guess is we'll probably have it done by this summer maybe or close to. And we've actually started a new conference that used to be J Hipster Conf in Paris. And this year we're doing J Hipster Code. And we're inviting everyone to come code with us. And so instead of having like sessions where you actually sit and learn from someone, you actually are going to have sessions where you sit and code with other people. So we're going to try that out. We have a J Hipster Developer Association now. It costs one euro to join for each year. So if you'd like to be a part of the J Hipster company in a sense, you could. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So if you have any questions, we're available on Twitter. Our direct messages are wide open. We do throw up email because we recognize that most people are still, you know, using email. Anyone not on email? <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, we'll upload this presentation to Speaker Deck later this evening. And then you saw where we put the repo on GitHub. All right. And thanks for coming. Thank you all for being here. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe everything worked. <laughs> I can. <laughs> so before we start the raffle, are there any Questions that we can answer? Well, you can ask him at the bar. Well, Fernand has one. Did you hear that? This is for the record. We killed it, Fernand said. <laughs> well, actually, I'm glad you reminded me. I got my J Hipster tattoos there. Well, right? so I'm a big fan. Nice. I, how do I get one of you a good one myself? I, I should have brought you some. Yeah. I got some at home. <laughs> I wear them on my neck too, but they don't stick as well, you know. Oh, I see. Yeah. All right. Well, if you want to join us at Ale House after, we'll be buying some drinks and snacks over there, and we'll do the raffle and yeah. uh, have a good night. All right. <laughs>